We are now going. And then Michael, just give me a thumbs up when you're ready. All right. <clears throat> Hello and welcome back to the Nothing But Net podcast, the podcast for triple net commercial real estate investing. I'm your host, Adam Carswell, joined by our co-host, Michael Fight, And we have another treat for you guys here today, Bill Exeter of Exeter Trust Company. Um, we're going to dive into his extensive knowledge and background in 1031s, which is a very hot topic in today's market. So I know I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And Michael, I'm sure you've you know probably got at least 10 times the amount of more detailed and uh, focused questions than I could in my uh, my rookie real estate journey here. So we're looking forward to the cross pollination of you know Bill, 37 years in this space, folks. 37 years, 17 with Exeter Trust Company, um, and again Michael Michael Flight here of, of Liberty Fund. Uh, yeah, looking forward to today's conversation. And um, Bill, how are you feeling, my friend? I am good. How are you guys doing? We are great. I guess, Michael, I should also ask you, how are you feeling today too, right? <laughs> I, I am doing great. I'm looking forward to Bill because, um, you know, the single most thing that comes up with me all the time in uh, net lease investing is, oh, is that all for 1031s? And we like to say, no, it's not all for 1031s, but it's a fantastic tool to use if you're trading out of another property because you know the net lease property are the super stable things. And so uh, net lease properties are usually targets um, in you know a 1031 exchange. So we are excited to have somebody like Bill Exeter that knows the ins and outs of this, has been in business for a long time, um, and is with, you know, cause the other issue is, is that you need to have somebody that not only knows what they're doing in 1031, but also has the financial stability because you're actually parking your money with them. So we really like the fact that bill is that package wrapped up all in one in their nationwide. So with that, I'll, I'll kick it off to you, Adam, for the first question. Yeah, let's um I guess let's dive into the story and the background a little bit here before we uh get into the nerdy questions if you will. I mean, Bill, <laughs> 37 years in the 1031 space. That's that's a lot of experience. Um how did it all begin and if you could summarize it, you know, in a, in a couple uh <laughs> in a couple minutes, how'd you get from there to here today? Completely by accident. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was controller of a bank up in Los Angeles, and the chairman had decided to start a 1031 exchange accommodator. That was before we were called qualified intermediaries. And outside counsel said, do not have the escrow subsidiary run it. So he looked around, threw it at me, and I had absolutely no idea what a 1031 exchange was. And coincidentally, just a few months later, uh, UCLA had a, so it was like a two and a half day uh, uh cooperative extension program just on 1031 exchanges. And from there, it's been uh, 37 years later. So <laughs> what you're saying is you did your graduate studies at UCLA in 1031. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's amazing how that happens. It just kind of drops in your lap. So yeah. And then uh, your company now you guys have been operating, I believe you said for 17 years. Yes. So we started in 2004 and, and really did that because we wanted to be able to make sure we could take care of the client, all clients. And all clients have different needs, uh, some you know real basic and some very, very sophisticated. And some want to be very conservative and some want to be very aggressive. And there were certain types of transactions that the larger exchange companies that we were running at the time couldn't do because they were publicly traded or you know, various things like that. So we thought, you know, it's not right to tell a client you can't take care of them because I'm publicly traded. So we decided at that point, it was time to start our own company so we could take care of the client. And then Bill, you've got offices throughout the United States. So you're currently based in San Diego. Uh, and then what other uh, areas do you, do you guys cover? Uh, yeah, our headquarters, national headquarters is in San Diego. Uh, we do have uh, sales offices, one person sales offices in Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, we have an administrative office up in Seattle. Uh, we do have a regional office in Cheyenne, and that's actually where our trust company is headquartered. Um, and then we also have a, a 1031 exchange administrative group in Cheyenne. 
Uh, we have another regional office in uh, Chicago. Uh, that's where one of our 1031 exchange operations is based. It's also got some of our back office, our CFO is there, et cetera. Uh, and then we have a small sales office down in uh, Florida. Okay, fantastic. I've, I've got I've got one one more question for Bill here, Michael, and then I'm going to hand it off to you. And that question is, you know, it seems like uh, 1031 has been a hot topic recently, probably more than the past few years. And so, I mean, just tell us a little bit about your uh, your workflow. Have things changed significantly for you guys within the past, uh, say, past year? Uh, it has. In fact, when COVID really hit, uh, you know, we were obviously just like everyone else, you're concerned about what's going to happen. Uh, we saw, you know, it was surprising. We expected it to be much worse. We saw about a two and a half month uh, kind of drop off and then it came back fairly quickly, which was surprising. Uh, but then in 2021, just the last three to four months, our transaction volume has quadrupled. Uh, it's just, it's kind of like a perfect storm. You've got a pent up demand from the COVID days. People were either trying to do deals or want to do deals and now they can. You've got pent up or built up cash positions from all the uh, cash they didn't spend, the unemployment checks, the PPP loans, et cetera, and the stimulus checks. You've got phenomenally low interest rates. And then you've got the Biden administration, you know, talking about either limiting or restricting the 1031 exchange. So all of that, people have just kind of gone crazy. And, and then you add that to a frothy market and it's just gone bananas. Yeah, that's the, the big elephant in the room is, you know, is the, uh, the 1031 exchange going to make it out through the sausage making process of uh, politics? So <laughs> that's right. <laughs> That's a good way to describe it because that is a grinder. <laughs> yeah. It, it, so w will you get a bratwurst or will you get the mini wiener? So that's. that's <laughs> <right>. <laughs> but anyway, Bill, we'd like to talk about happier things. Like um, we keep throwing around 1031 and 1031 exchange. And uh, we're talking about it like everybody knows what that is. But um, a lot of people don't even know what why you would call something like this a 1031 and, and what it is and, and what it does. So can you give us the basics of, you know, why it's even called a 1031, um, what you want to use it for and, um, you know, what, what it actually is? Sure. Uh, and it's known by many things. You know, if you go way back to when I first got into business, it was called, you know, like kind exchanges or starker exchanges. Uh, things like that, tax deferred exchanges, they all really kind of mean the same thing. Um, fast forward, it's typically called the 1031 exchange. It's named after the tax code. Uh, so it's section 1031 of the Internal Revenue Code. And interesting, this is its 100th year anniversary. So it's been around 100 years uh, this year. I had no uh, idea it was around that long. Been around that long. So it's, it's kind of a crazy thing. So it's, and it's all about it's deferring taxes. There. So you get, uh, you know, probably a perfect example is an is a individual that somehow ends up with a single family house and they own it for, say, five years and they decide, I really like real estate. I'm going to sell this and buy a duplex or a fourplex or what have you. And then they talk to their accountant and get that incredibly bad news about how much taxes they're going to pay. And that's when the accountant hopefully will say, well, you know, you can sell your current property. And if you do a 1031 exchange, you can defer your federal and your state taxes by reinvesting in other rental investment or business use property. Um, and that's when they hopefully the light bulb goes on and they realize it's really a way to trade up into something bigger, better, more cash flow for them, not paying taxes. So it keeps all of their money, all their equity in their pocket instead of paying federal and state taxes. And so this is a way to legally extend not paying the taxes that are due now, correct? Exactly. Okay. That's really cool. That's a, a great tool. And I, like I said, I, I had no idea it was around for 100 years. I thought it was something that um, they just kind of invented with the high tax rates in the 1970s, because that's when you, you really hear about it. Um, so if somebody wanted to do a, a, a somebody would let's say they're selling a multifamily apartment building and they've had that in the family for a while and this person you know like I know all kinds of uh, it, it's 
guys, uh, but I do know a few women that have just bought properties back in the 19, you know, 70s and 1980s, uh, fully paid off the property and all the rest of it, and are really tired of, you know, going and, you know, making sure that uh, the porches are swept and making, you know, tenants calling them in the middle of the night and everything else. And so they want to sell. And as you said, they find out that they've got this huge tax liability. So what, you know, is their next step in, in order to like say, well, maybe there's a way I can get cash flow from, you know, a less property management intensive asset, like a net lease property. Um, what is their next step in order to like trade into that to, to defer or, you know, um, reduce those taxes? Sure. And, and I think you hit the nail on the head when you mentioned taxes and tax liability. First step is they need to talk to their accountant. They need to know exactly what they're looking at. Sometimes there's other things uh, that may come into play on their tax return that may offset the gain, or you know, maybe there's a net loss carry forward or something like that. So they, they really need to sit down with their accountant and make sure they've got a taxable gain. In most cases, the answer is yes, and it's painful. Uh, and then from there, they have to decide what do, what, what do they want to reinvest in? What's the next step? And that's really where they'll talk to someone like you and kind of go through the options that they can invest in. Uh, and the, the options are really broad. I mean, people think, uh, well, I should back up, you know, people hear the term like kind exchange and they misinterpret that and think like kind means condo for condo, apartments for apartments. And that is absolutely not true. It literally means like kind means that you're selling real estate and you have to buy real estate. Simple as that. So as long as they're selling something that is rental or investment or used in the business and they reinvest in something that's also either rental investment or used in a business, it qualifies for 1031 exchange treatment. So it's a very broad definition of what they can acquire. So it's really, you know, sitting down and trying to understand what they want. Um, and you mentioned, you know, the, the tenants and, you know, we joke about it. We call it the terrible T's, you know, the tenants, tax, trash, toilets, teenagers, toddlers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it boils <laughs> That's a new down one, to a longer of... list than we do. We're just uh, usually uh, tenants, taxes, and toilets or in term. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I have a two and a half year old, so I added toddler to that really quickly. <laughs> wow. Wow. I, I can't even imagine having kids at that age again. You know, mine are... Uh... My, my, my one is completely out and the other one is on his way out. So, but uh, I wanted to follow up with you. Um, the like kind, so I could sell my apartment building or I could sell my, um, you know, multi-tenant office building and I could actually trade into something like a ground lease that, you know, was just a land lease as long as it was producing rent. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah, ground leases of 30 years or more would qualify as like-kind property. Uh, even things that investors rarely think of, like uh, water rights, air rights, mineral rights, certain types of oil and gas interests, uh, anything that's really defined by state law as real estate is going to qualify. So very broad definition. But if you're, I guess my one caution there is if you're a beginning investor, beginner, uh, be careful what you go after. Some of these things are really exotic and they sound all, you know, fun and exciting. And, but if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't understand the investment you're buying, you're probably asking for trouble. So be careful, stick to what you know, uh, invest where you know, and that's where you're going to do best. Yeah. And my uh, caution to everybody is um, don't let the tax dog, uh, the, the tax tail uh, wag the dog. So, you know, uh, it might seem like a great thing, uh, but, you know, you might get into something that you really didn't want to do and you're going to rush through it and you're going to like be under pressure and I got to do this, I got to do this. And then, you know, it, it ends up just being a nightmare. Absolutely. Well, it's amazing how many people, you know, sell and they hear this buzzword 1031 exchange, they jump into it. And sticking with the theme of the dog and the tail, if you buy junk property, you end up with fleas. So <laughs> careful of what you buy. And sometimes you start an exchange and you sell and we're holding the cash proceeds for you. And if you can't find something that makes sense, sometimes it's okay to pay the tax. Just let the exchange fail. There's no penalty for a failed exchange. You just pay the tax. And you, know, you really do your best efforts to find something. But if you can't, uh, don't buy junk just to defer the tax. 
Okay. Would you recommend if, first of all, you said they should talk to their uh, tax accountant, um, but would you recommend uh, before they even decide to, to sell or even start that process or is early on in the process to, you know, speak with somebody like you to also guide them through what they're going to need to do to be legally compliant? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we could sit down and kind of walk them through the process, uh, answer the, you know, the general questions of the timelines, which are probably the most difficult part of the 1031 exchange. With the 1031, it's all about planning and, you know, getting your ducks in a row. Uh, so really talking to us up front. So really your accountant is going to define what your, the bad news is, how much tax you're going to have to pay. And then he can also, he or she can also help plan uh, you know, what you should do through the 1031 exchange. Do you do a full exchange? Do you do a partial exchange? Um, there's a lot of tax planning that can happen there. Most people don't. They just call their accountant when it's time to file their tax return, and that's when they get the surprises. Planning is critical to make sure you really should be doing this. And then I like the way you approach that because, you know, we always try to say that the 1031 exchange should really put you in a better position and only you can define what that means. So you have to kind of decide what's right for you. What's your goals? What are your objectives? What do you want to accomplish? And then will the 1031 exchange get you there? And again, if you start it and you can't seem to get there, then it could be okay just to pay the tax. Yeah. I'd like to know, how do you, um, how do you ensure that you're working with an accountant that is um, familiar with, this space as well, because I think some folks out there might have an accountant that's going to tell them, you know, whatever, but maybe they've never dealt with the 1031 space before. So maybe they give them information that even like you guys would be like, wait, no, 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 that's not right. This is how it works. So how do you just, how do you know where to go for the right accountant in the first place? That's a really good question. Uh, there's a lot of good accountants out there that are really good at tax, but that doesn't mean they specialize in real estate. And, and this is all about real estate. So you really need to have an accountant who is not just great at tax, but also really has a lot of experience in the real estate world. Uh, because there's more than just 1031 exchanges. There's all sorts of depreciation issues. And you know, there's the 1031 exchange when you're ready to reposition. And so I, you start asking questions of the various accountants you're interviewing. Don't ask yes or no questions, ask open-ended questions. And you'll quickly figure out those who really know what they're talking about and those who aren't. You can ask questions like how many of your clients uh, work with real estate and what type of real estate? What's the most complicated transaction you've had before? Uh, give me an idea of your complicated 1031 exchanges you've helped the clients through and just see what they say. And you can usually tell if they know what they're talking about. Yeah, Adam's uh, pumping for his buddy, Tom Wheelwright. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Trying to get him on the podcast. So, but anyway, um, Bill, uh, the next question I have is um, you had said that you, and this is something that I didn't even know, you don't have to, you can only do a partial exchange. You can take some of the money and, you know, uh, invest some of the money and then pay taxes on, on the other part of the money. How does that work? Absolutely. Um, and probably the most common example is it's the old adage. Most people are real estate rich and cash poor. And I think we, most of us fall into that, uh, that category. And so maybe you sell for $2 million and you reinvest maybe at 1.8 million. So you trade down by 200,000. Um, and so when, it, when the dust settles, you end up with $200,000 in your pocket. Of course, I'm ignoring closing costs, but right. uh, so with that, you know, you sell for two, you buy for 1.8, you trade down by 200,000, only the 200,000 would be taxable. Uh, it is all applied to taxable gain. They don't prorate your cost basis. So that's all taxable. Uh, but that's okay. If you know you're going to do that, and a lot of people do it for strategic reasons, uh, then you've got a successful 1031 exchange and you only pay tax on what you pull out. But the million or you, uh, you could there. talk to your tax advisor too, and yeah. they could say, you know what, you have a net operating loss carry forward of $200,000. So if you pull right. 200 out, it's taxable, but you've got an offset. So right. it just depends on your situation. Right. And then just to reiterate, the million eight in that specific example um, is tax deferred. So there's no tax consequences on that at that point in time, correct? Exactly. Yep, that's correct. Wow, that's phenomenal. So what um, I know you got a question. I do. I do. <laughs> um, again, kind of circling back to uh, the recent spike in interest in 
1031 exchanges. I mean, what are you seeing right now in the marketplace as far as um, anyone who is utilizing this vehicle? You know, what is there anything that stands out to you right now that's more popular than it has been in the past as far as transferring this wealth? Ooh, good question. There's a lot of things going on right now. Of course, our headquarters is in California. So we see a lot of people exchanging out of California because of all the crazy political stuff going on. Um, and, and so that's probably the biggest trend we see you know, nationwide from what we do. Uh, you get a lot of people, though, that think, oh, my gosh, this market is phenomenally hot. It's really frothy. I'm going to get a great price. They sell. They get a bidding war. They get 100000 over asking price. Uh, they sell, they go into a 1031 exchange, and then the question is, oh, no, what, do I, what the heck do I buy? <laughs> right, right, because there's the bidding war on the other side. <laughs> exactly, and it's, it's a lot of people don't really think in advance or plan well enough in advance as to what they really want to get into, it's, uh, and they just kind of jump into it. So that's, that's one of the things we see quite a bit where then they panic and it's trying to figure out what are they going to buy. Um, you get a lot of people scratching their head, though, and you get the, the folks that are close to retirement or in retirement. And going back to what we talked about, they really want to get rid of all the management headaches. So they'll look at things like net lease properties and whatnot so they can just get a check every month. Um, you get people who really love property management. So they're looking for maybe a larger apartment complex to improve cash flow. But you, you tend to see them trying to buy in areas that either it's a state with no tax or it's a state that cash flows better, has better valuations, things like that. You see a lot of, at least we do, we see a lot of people <clears throat> trying to do kind of a value add play, buying a C plus or B minus property, and then adding some value to it. Maybe a couple of years later, selling it as a B plus or an A minus property. So Bill, let's go back to your example of the 2 million and get down to like really simple basics. So if somebody sold their property and had a, a $2 million um, gain, what would be the next steps? And, and their accountant said, yeah, um, you should go and, and find a property, do a 1031 exchange. What would be their next steps? Um, what would be the timelines to accomplish that? And you know, how early should they get involved with you uh, in order to do that? Good question. Um, <clears throat> I'll start with us. You know, uh, you know, the most important thing is you have to have the 1031 exchange set up and in place before anything closes. Once the, once the transaction closes, there's no way to go back and restructure as a 1031 exchange. And it amazes me. We get calls literally every week where someone says, I closed last week or last month and I want to do an exchange. It's like, well, it's too late. Uh, so get that involved. Back up. Could you just repeat what you just said for everybody to hear? that they need to have the structure or at least the, the, the thing set up before they close on selling their property. Yes, and, and then I'll get a little deeper too. They need to retain a qualified intermediary. Uh, the qualified intermediary has to draft all the 1031 exchange documents. They have to be executed before the closing occurs. And, and this gets a little deep, but the reason for that is the purchase and sale agreement for the sale of the property is assigned to the qualified intermediary, and that's what prevents the tax consequence. So if the closing occurs, it doesn't matter what you tell the closing agent. Even if you say, don't disperse the money, I'm going to do a 1031 exchange, they have the right to the funds, and that's what triggers the tax consequence. So exchange has to be in place before closing, otherwise it's taxable. There's no way to go back and fix that. So they need, before they close, if they're working on a contract right now, they need to get in touch with somebody like you and they need to draft up the proper documents. And um, they also included in that is going to be an assignment. Uh, so at closing, the proceeds from the, their closing are going to be assigned to you. Is that, am I getting that correct? Yep, Absolutely. Okay. Exactly right. And then the closing is what triggers everything. So it's not signing the contract or opening escrow or opening the, the transaction or anything like that. It's the actual closing. So when it closes and the buyer has the right to the property, that's what triggers everything. And that's what starts their 45 days to identify what they're going to acquire. And that's probably the most difficult part of the 1031 exchange, especially in today's market. Uh, 45 days flies by very quickly. It's six weekends. Um, so it's a very quick process. 
And then a lot of investors so think can, it's can 45. We just and, and, and go through what is the 45 days, Bill? And then I'll, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but what is that sure. 45 day part? And what is the ideal the 45, 45 days? days is the, look like? I'm sorry, go ahead. I just said the ideal 45 days, because I'm sure there's some nightmare 45 day timelines as well. But. <laughs> yeah, that is true. <laughs> the, the ideal 45 days is, you know, they've, they've done some planning in advance. They kind of know what they want to buy, or at least the asset class, and they've got an idea. Um, and when you're in the 45 days, then you've got the 45 day period to pick uh, properties you want to identify. Most people use the three property rule. So you identify up to three properties, probably with the idea of identifying three and buying one. Um, although you could buy all three if you wanted to. The second and third are really backup identified properties. So if the first one can't be acquired for any reason, you've got a second and a third as backup identified properties. Uh, in today's market, it, that doesn't work so well. Uh, it's a fast market. And if you can't close on your first one, the second and the third properties are probably long gone. But in theory, you identify three with the intent to buy one and you've got a second and a third backup property. So all it means is by midnight of the 45th day, you're going to identify to the qualified intermediary the three properties you're going to identify. Now, there's other rules as well, uh, which is probably too much information for today's podcast, but uh, there's different ways to identify that the qualified intermediary should help you go through if it, if it makes sense for you. Well, we're going to bring you on for your uh, master's class from UCLA to go into the deepest <laughs> again. So, but um, I just want to uh, get clear on, so what is all involved with identifying? So, you know, so that, is there something specific that they have to do and, and, you know, just to, to make sure, and you, you also said there's the three property rule. Um, can you identify more than three properties or is there a specific limitation in the tax code for what they can do? Sure. And the identification process is, the actual identification process is actually very straightforward, very simple. Most qualified intermediaries will provide them with some type of an identification form. So literally you just fill it out, property one, address, property two, address, property three, address, et cetera, and you sign it you email it or fax it over to them and that's considered identification. So it's very easy. Uh, you don't have to have even talked to the seller of the property. You don't have to have an offer or accepted offer or under contract. Uh, however, having said that, uh, the farther you get in the offer, acceptance, offer, contract, closing process, the safer your 1031 exchange is. Uh, you know, Once you've sold, you've triggered your gain and if you can't identify and then buy something within those time frames, then it's failed and you pay taxes. So the farther you get in your acquisition process, the safer your 1031 exchange will be. Okay. All right. So, and then once they identify what's it, and they decide to, to close on, on one, what's the next steps for, you know, within that 45 days? Then really the next step is they've identified, let's say by midnight of the 45th day, then they have an additional 135 days after the 45 day window for a total of 180 days. And that's important. A lot of people think it's 45 plus 180. It's actually 45 plus an additional 135 days to actually complete your purchases and close on your purchases for a total of 180 days. So after the 45 days, uh, you're gonna let us know as the qualified intermediary, this is the actual property I've decided to pursue. Uh, here's the person who's gonna handle the closing for us. Here's the escrow company, the title company, the closing attorney, et cetera. And then we'll work directly with them to get it all set up and ready to go. Okay, okay. And um, are there certain things that sometimes come up uh, within that, like for example, if they don't close, then you know they, they end up having to pay the, the, uh, the gains on whatever they have, correct? Correct. And, and, you know, stuff does happen. I mean, sometimes you go into the closing process and all of a sudden you complete your due diligence and you find some problems and decide not to buy it. It might be a defect to title and you can't close until that's wrapped up and they can't fix that till after the 180 day mark. So the sooner you get stuff going, the sooner you go under contract, you know, the closer to closing, the safer, and that buys you more time in case problems do come up. Okay. And then if, say, um, something does go wrong during the closing, and I know you said maybe the other 
properties identified might be long gone by the time you you, you circle back. Is there a way to um, still identify another property in case the one that's being closed on isn't going to work out? Uh, you can if it's still within the 45 day window. Uh, once you've passed midnight of the 45th day, then you're stuck with what you, you've identified. Uh, at that point, you can't go back and change anything. So that's why the further along you can get, the safer it is. Because once you pass the 45 day window, there's no turning back. There's no changes allowed. Okay. And um, my next question is, so once they close on selling their property and transfer the title over to you, their money also is transferred over to you, correct? So that you're the qualified intermediary and you're holding that in escrow for them? Yes, absolutely. And so the, when the sale closes, then of course it, it'll close. Uh, they'll authorize the recordation of the deed. So the deed will get recorded. The buyer gets title to the property. Uh, then the closing agent will balance out the file, make sure everything is you know kosher and balanced, et cetera. And then the net proceeds get wire transferred to us. Uh, one of the important things there, uh, and we can go into more detail on the UCLA master program. <laughs> <laughs> one of the important things there is the fund should be held in the qualified trust account or a qualified escrow account. Um, and so that's one of the reasons we started Exeter Trust Company is so we can offer a qualified trust account to the client. That clearly shows the funds are client funds or fiduciary funds. They're not corporate funds. That's important. Okay. And how long has Exeter Trust been in business at the same 17 years then? No, the Exeter 1031 Exchange and most of the family have been around for 17 years. Uh, Exeter Trust now is going into its fourth year. Okay. Okay. But it's also important to, uh, you know, be... Uh, aware of when you're uh, working with a qualified intermediary that they've been around for a while and that they know what they're doing um, because there was uh, the, the whole DST, for lack of a better word, scandal back, um, you know, I think it was around the, 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 the last downturn in 2008, right, where uh, some of the title companies went under because they were undercapitalized, so. Absolutely, yep. Uh, probably the biggest one was Land America with Land America Title, Land America Financial. And, and actually the 1031 exchange qualified intermediary took the entire company down. So it was what the exchange company invested in that started the entire problem. Uh, there wasn't uh, any fraud or there wasn't embezzlement of funds or anything like that. It was just a, a an investment that wasn't prudent for 1031 exchange funds. And the downturn kind of exacerbated the problem and there we are. But we learned a lot from that, uh, that whole fiasco. Okay. I just want to, you know, you know, I'm not trying to bring up bad news, but you know, people need to be aware that uh, they should go with somebody that's trusted and, you know, been around for a while and knows what they're doing. Uh, absolutely. It's a good point. Cause there, there are failures. I mean, 37 years, I've seen a number of them fail. Uh, usually, unfortunately it is some type of misappropriation of funds or embezzlement or something like that. So it's good to know who the who the company is. Uh, check their bonding. Um, you know, I think one of the most important things is: do they have any kind of regulatory or government oversight? Because they're subject to an annual audit, and if there's anything going on, the audit's likely going to catch it and making sure that they're operating in a safe and sound manner. And I think that's critical. I would guesstimate that. 99, maybe 98 percent of qualified intermediaries have no regulatory oversight, and that's the scary part. <laughs> that well, that's something i also didn't know so <laughs> what would be um and i guess i'll put a, a stress or emphasis on this one not advice um but your recommendation will say from the examples we've used so far if you were um an investor with two million dollars to move living in california looking to you know place that capital somewhere else what would you do bill where would you go? What are you looking at right now? I would certainly get out of California. <laughs> <laughs> I live man, here, so I can as, say that. <laughs> as a man sitting in Chicago area, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the when you're in California, the political environment is, is just crazy um, for, on many levels, many reasons. And then, of course, the valuations are nuts. So reinvesting in California is very difficult to make a pencil out. Uh, the market's already frothy. So the question is, where can it go from here? 
Uh, so I would certainly look at getting out for many reasons. There's all sorts of rent control bills and measures that keep coming up and uh, they, they keep attacking prop, uh, you know, like Prop 13 and property tax type initiatives to get more property taxes. That's just, they're just going to keep doing that over and over. Um, so that's why many people are getting out. There's just, they're getting hit by so many things and from so many different angles that it's like, why be a landlord here? Right, right. So starting to get out. Uh, you, you, you tend to see a lot of people going into areas that have better property valuations, better cash flow, it pencils out better. So whether that be a state that has no taxes like Texas or Florida or Washington or Wyoming, or whether that be an area like uh, North and South Carolina is a popular area, Tennessee is a popular area, you can get a lot of great properties, good valuations, good cash flow. So they look at those. I'm just naming the first few that come to mind, but you certainly look at areas like that, but then you get investors who say, I still live in California, or I still live in New York or what have you. And if I sell and I buy out of state, then I have long distance property management. So that's something you have to look at as well and be comfortable with that. And to wrap this up, Bill, so we've gone through the entire process, except how does it end? How, how does it, you know, how does the, the whole thing get wrapped up? and they have their new property, they've done everything legally, and you know, what, what does that look like you know, on, on the other side of the exchange? It's my favorite answer, it depends. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll give you where, where we're at today, but there's all sorts of planned, not planned, there's all sorts of you know, Biden administration proposals flying all over the place. So it depends on what happens in the next say six months or so. Um, you know, today, if you uh, sell, you do an exchange and you buy property that's equal or greater than what you sold. So you've traded equal or up in value. You've reinvested all your equity. You've deferred all of your taxes. Uh, that's the ideal outcome. Defer, defer, defer. And then if you keep 1031 exchanging over your lifetime, when you pass on under the current tax law, you get a step up in cost basis. So that's that's a complicated term, but let's say you bought property years ago for 100,000, uh, today you pass and the property is worth a million today. Under the current tax law, whoever you leave that property to, your kids, your grandkids, friends, whatever, they get a step up in cost basis. So their cost basis is stepped up or increased to the fair market value at the date of death, which would be $1 million in that case. So they could sell the property tomorrow for a million dollars their cost basis is now stepped up to a million dollars. They pay zero taxes. So we have a morbid sense of humor. We call it swap until you drop. <laughs> <laughs> that'll, that'll help you remember that's a strategy, but it depends uh, on what that's happens the, with the that's Biden the administration. Title of, that's the title of this episode. <laughs> I think our, our buddy, uh, our buddy, our buddy, Matt Bear might have shared that on the show once too. Now I think about it. <laughs> Yep, swap until you drop. No, no, we have a morbid sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. At the, at the end of the thing, they close on the other property, and that basically the, the money transfers into the other property at closing, and then they, they close out um, whatever they're doing with Exeter. Is that correct? Exactly. And at that point, we're done. We're out of the picture. Uh, the important thing is they have to have the intent to continue to hold it for rental investment or business use. So generally they've bought another rental property and, uh, you know, if they've, if they were trying to get away from property management headaches, hopefully they're in net lease properties or something like that where they don't have to manage it. Uh, they just collect a check every month. Uh, maybe five years later, they decide to sell that as well and do another 1031 exchange. They just keep repositioning, rebuilding, re uh, diversifying their, their portfolio and building their net worth. Fantastic. And Michael, would, would an individual be able to uh, 1031 into investing with Liberty Fund? Unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, it is a fund. a fund and it's not uh, set up as they, there, there are funds out there that are called DSTs, which are Delaware statutory trusts. And um, you can transfer into a portion of those. Uh, we are not set up as a Delaware statutory trust. Uh, it is a um, security token. So it's basically just like a, a regular syndication. So you're not buying the actual property, you're investing in a uh, security. And uh, 
you know, I always like to get resources when we can here, Michael. Um, sometimes I like learning about, you know, the books that taught everyone everything before the year 1990, which is around my <laughs> entrance into this world. So, um, and we're going to get the grad degree in 1031s coming up here soon too on the show as well. That might be the, the topic of that episode, but um, what are, what are some of your top, you know, resources or recommendations, Bill, as far as our, our listeners going to learn more aside from going to I, your website too, right? <laughs> I'm kind of guessing that uh, Harry Potter does not come into play here. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's you a know, lot of fantasy sometimes involved with real estate, but uh, <laughs> and when, and I, the- I still go back to Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, you know, it's kind of it's applicable to many industries, not just real estate, of course. But it, I think it really kind of points people in the right direction and and what have you. There we go. First time that we've had that book reference on the show. So there we, there we go. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Classic. Like Stephen Covey, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, where can people go if they are considering selling and have any inkling, even over the next uh, year or two, whether they might want to do a 1031? Uh, where could they go to learn more about you and Exeter? Uh, they can go to our website. We have uh, lots of educational material out there. Uh, so it's exeterco.com. So it's E-X-E-T-E-R-C-O.com. Uh, or they can just give us a call here at our corporate headquarters uh, at 619-239-3091. And I do want to praise exeterco.com's website because they have videos and other materials that are up there explaining this. So if you're looking for, you know, a resource, um, that's probably the first place I would go to learn a little bit more about, uh, depending on how you learn. Um, you know, if you're a, a video type of person, they've got video, they've got articles, they've got everything there. If you have a hard time sleeping, that's a good place to go. <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested in learning more about net lease properties or you're interested in learning about, you know, what a security token is in private, uh, stable, tradable real estate, you can go to libertyfund.io. That's what I, I was going to ask, Michael. I think you could probably go, go between the two websites if you're really having a hard time sleeping. <laughs> um, and speaking of Liberty, real quick, Michael, can you uh, just give us an update on, on where we're at right now? Uh, we're doing fantastic, Adam, you know, getting a lot of uh, people very interested in it, uh, interested in the um, not only the stable properties, but also the um, the ability to trade a uh, real estate security after one year. So uh, there's a lot of people that are saying, well, maybe this is worth taking a look at, because if I don't really like it, I can you know, actually have the ability to get out of it a little sooner than I would a normal private real estate investment. Absolutely. All right. Well, time to wind it down. Uh, Bill, I guess one more time, any, uh, any parting words of wisdom for our audience here today? Oh, it's my favorite one. Persistence, never give up. Uh, It doesn't matter if you're the smartest person in the room or not, just don't give up. Mm -hmm. Love it. And Michael, any, any closing remarks from you? I just want to thank Bill for giving us his time, giving us his knowledge and, uh, you know, everything that, you know, he's, uh, he's put out here today. It's, it, I've learned some things that I didn't know. And uh, we are definitely going to try. He's a busy man to get a hold of, but we're definitely going to try to book him for his master's level program in 1031. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Happy to do it. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for tuning in to the Nothing But Net podcast, the podcast for triple net commercial real estate investing. I'm your host, Adam Carswell, and we are joined, of course, as always, by our co-host, Michael Flight. Our guest today was Bill Exeter of Exeter 1031 and Exeter Trust Company. I think we're going to the name of this episode, jokingly or seriously. We'll see. Swap until you drop. We'll see what, what makes it there in the headlines. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for investing your most valuable resource with us here today, your time. And we will catch you in the next episode.